Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and it's time for my top 10 comic books of the week. That's right, everybody. Thanks for checking out the video. I am Rockin' Robbie Billups. This is my top 10 comic books of the week. It's not a spec list. It's not like books that are guaranteed to go up in value or anything like that. Just to me, these, out of everything that came out this week, these were the 10 best reads, and I would definitely recommend that you check them out. At number 10, No Heroin, number one, from Source Point Press. Written by Frank Gogol, with art by Chris Madd, colors by Shauna Madd, and letters by Sean Reinhardt. No Heroin is a new one from writer Frank Gogol, who had recently finished Dead End Kids. This comes from Source Point Press, and it's a little bit like a gritty, edgier version of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. The basic premise goes like this. There's a lady, and she is now like 90 days clean off of hard drugs. We're talking about stuff like heroin, right? Get the, you know, you get the title, right? Um, but it's pretty solid. It's pretty decent. It's intriguing. And now that she's off of heroin, she's trying to get her life back together, trying to make amends, trying to, to improve her station in life, her place. And then she gets wrapped up in all this stuff with vampires. And that's pretty nifty. The book sells me at times, and then it dissells me at other times. I don't even know if dissell is a word, but the artwork is a bit inconsistent for me. At times, the line work is pretty clean and precise and dynamic. At other times, it feels a little sloppy and a little rushed. Aside from that inconsistency, I thought the book was pretty interesting. It's a neat premise. It's got a great uh, variety of covers attached to it. It's been heating up on the the spec market, I think, and I don't know. I thought it was pretty decent, and more so is the potential that it has to become something truly unique and spectacular. I don't think it's there yet, but it definitely has the potential to get there. If you're a hardcore Buffy the Vampire fan, if you love independent books, especially when they're focused on vampires and horror, and if you like a good story about someone trying to do the right thing, but they get thrown in to a crazy vampiric mix, this book's for you. At number nine, Vlad Dracul, number one, from Scout Comics. Written by Matteo Strukel, with artwork by Andrea Muti, and lettering by Joel Rodriguez. Vlad Dracul is absolutely a gorgeous, beautiful book. It's got artwork by Andrea Muti, who was the artist of Vault Comics' Fearscape, one of my favorite books of the last couple years. And if you've seen his work on there, you still haven't seen nothing yet. To me, this is more precise, more atmospheric, more ethereal, more appropriate even to the tone of this story. The story itself is okay, it's pretty decent. It's obviously dealing with the historical Vlad the Impaler, of course, where we get the legend of Dracula from. The story's got some moments that I'm like, mm, maybe quite not, maybe it doesn't flow quite so well, but oh my goodness, the artwork in this book is amazing. It's beautiful. This is one of those books that I'm solely into, mostly for the art. That rarely happens. To me, it needs a real strong story. Nothing about the story really was that compelling to me, except for the idea that it focuses on Vlad, which is, I mean, Dracula is one of my favorite characters in fiction and in non-fiction, right? But the artwork was absolutely gorgeous. This is extra size. It's going to be a three-issue series. I was pretty pumped for it. That art did not let me down. Maybe the story did just a little bit, but that's why it's number nine. At number eight, Batman 95 from DC Comics. Written by James Tiny IV with artwork by Jorge Jimenez, coloring by Tomo Mori, lettering by Clayton Cowles. So Batman 95 is the official start of the Joker War. Now, it feels like we've been reading the Joker War for quite a few issues now because the end of his dark designs was pretty much all set up for this. But now that it's all set up, it's time to see the dominoes start falling. I really did like this issue. I've said this on the weekly comic book review. I'll say it again. Whenever, I, I like James Tynion's Batman run. I really, really do. But whenever Jorge Jimenez is on it, oh my goodness, it blows me away. He draws my favorite Joker out of modern day artists and the Joker and what he's doing is pretty top notch. It does kind of pick a little bit from Dark Knight Rises, but I'm a-okay with that. Punchline makes an appearance. She's awesome. I said this in the weekly comic book review, but she's what I wanted Harley Quinn to be. Deadly, crazy, psychotic, threatening, scary. That's what Punchline is, and so far, so freaking good. Like I said, Jorge Jimenez's artwork, especially with Maury's coloring, is one of the highlights of this. It's a pretty soft launch, but like I said, there's been so much dynamic craziness that's happened already that this is just yet another, I don't know, 
kernel in the popcorn pot. What? That makes no sense. But maybe I coined a new phrase. Maybe that's a popular one. I don't know. Batman 95, though, pretty dope. A great start to the Joker War. An exciting event. At number seven, Daredevil number 21 from Marvel Comics. Written by Chip Zdarsky with artwork by Marco Cicchetto, coloring by Mattia Iacono, and lettering by Clayton Cowles. Chip Zdarsky's just been tearing it up as far as Daredevil goes, and you know it, and I know it, and this is no surprise that yet again, an issue of Daredevil makes the top 10. This book has been top-notch and is definitely one of Marvel's best and most consistent books out there, especially a book that's not written by Donny Cates. Chip Zdarsky understands the legacy of this character. He understands Daredevil's place in Marvel history and how to make it feel familiar, yet different all at the same time, and do something truly different, unique, yet still anchored in that classic Daredevil feel. Marco Cicchetto's artwork is absolutely astonishing. The coloring really helps it pop even further. Clayton Cowles is just an exceptional letterer, especially on mainstream books. This book all around is just top notch. In this issue, you got a whole new game change type thing happening. It's a little bit of a slower issue, but some major things are happening, including some major developments and gear shifts in the life of Matt Murdock. It's very exciting. I'm exciting to see where the story's going to go. I can only imagine that we're about to hit some craziness once again, 20-something issues in, and Chip Zdarsky has yet to let me down on an issue of Daredevil. At number six, Wind Number Two from Boom Studios, written by James Tiny in the Fourth, artwork by Michael Dialinus, and lettering by Aditya Bidikar. So when Wind Number One came out. It made the top 10, but it wasn't that impressive of a first issue. Now, Wind was originally written to be a graphic novel, so it took some extra time for the story to get really rolling. Now, if you're doing a graphic novel, that's fine. But when you're doing issues, it made for a very incredibly weak issue number two, which was already extra size. But in issue number two, we finally get the gist of the story. We finally get the quest, the journey, the calling. It all finally happens. The characters become a bit more compelling. The motivations of the characters become an exceptionally bit more clear. And the gist and, and direction of the series is, is really clarified. And I thought that this book was absolutely fantastic. Totally better than issue number one. If they could have found some way to put some of this direction in issue number one, but I understand it was written as a graphic novel, and then at the last minute, Boom Studios changed their plans, and they're releasing it as a five-issue miniseries. This is an exercise issue at no additional cost. James Tynion has some very intriguing characters, a really cool light fantasy world, and he's being, being able to deal with some real thematic relevant material, even though it's kind of a light almost fairy tale type thing. It gets a little bit deep. It's got some interesting characters. They're going in different directions and I'm very excited to see how it comes together. Now, I know that this was originally written as a graphic novel, but I don't think it was intended to be just one graphic novel. I think it was intended to be a series of graphic novels because as we are right now, there's no way this story is going to wrap up in three issues, even if they're extra size. I'm expecting a little bit more of a long-term plan here and I hope I'm not let down. But so far, issue number two of Wend totally blew me away comparatively to issue number one, I thought this was a super solid issue. At number five, Kids, number five, from Ablaze Comics. Written by Arlene Ducadre, art by Jocelyn Jorette, lettering by Saida Timo Fonte. Kids is one of those rare zombie books that I absolutely love. There's two of them on shelves right now, including Year Zero from AWA. But Kids has a different perspective. We've seen tons of zombie fiction, tons of zombie apocalypse type stuff. It's always centered around a group of survivors, and sometimes there are kids, but for the most part, it's adults. In this story, it's nothing but kids. It starts off strong, and it stays very consistent. But in issue five, it takes a dark, tragic turn. The artwork is a bit cartoony. However, in this issue, what impressed me so much about it was that the artwork was able to handle these tragic, nuanced moments just as well as the fun, crazy, kooky action. I absolutely love this book. If you're into horror fiction, if you're into zombie fiction, and you're not reading kids, I think that's I think that's a shame. Kids is a great book. It's got some nice homage covers. In this one, they homage the Gorillaz' first album, and I love that album. It means a lot to me, so that was super, super cool. But this book, it hits, and it hits hard, and it was already fun and cool and exceptional, but now it just kind of went next level. I loved it. At number four, Power Rangers, Ranger Slayer, number one, from Boom Studios. 
Written by Ryan Parrott, with artwork by Dan Mora, coloring by Raul Angulo and Ed Dukeshire on the lettering. Ranger Slayer is one of those standout characters from the Power Rangers comic books, and now she gets her own one-shot comic book. So, last time we saw her, she was shunted back off into her reality, which is an alternate reality where Tommy became the evil Lord Draken and took over and killed Rita and a bunch of other people, and it's like Days of Future Past meets the Power Rangers, right? Shattered Grid was pretty cool, and the Power Ranger books have been consistently some of the best superhero comic books on shelves, at least in my opinion. Ranger Slayer was a great one-shot with exceptional artwork by Dan Mora, great coloring, a great job lettering. This book was cool. If you love Dan Mora's artwork, you definitely need to pick this one up. It's extra size, it's expensive, $7.99, but there's a lot of pages to it and it's a lot of story. This is a simple story that has some exciting developments, especially for longtime Power Rangers fans, and definitely some setup into her role that she will be playing in the coming future, in the Power Rangers comic books, Ryan Parrott's had a great vision for these characters, for this story, for this mythology, and I'm excited to see it continue. Ranger Slayer's one of those reasons why. At number three, Middle West, number 18, from Image Comics. Written by Scotty Young, with artwork by Jorge Corona, coloring by Jean-Francois Ballou, and Nate Picos on the lettering. Middle West comes to an end here with issue number 18, and what an exceptional finale for this very emotional and nuanced book. It's got amazing artwork. There's some great double page spreads in here, but what mostly impresses me about this book is that Scotty Young's pumping out to me the best writing of his career, and he's been doing some good stuff. But this book is about a kid running away from home from an abusive, neglectful father, and he starts fearing that he's going to become just like his father, like his father became just like his father. You get what I'm saying? So it's about that generational thing, the idea of the sins of the father, falling down to the kids. And it really comes out in a very physical way with the idea that they actually turn into these giant, tornadic, demon, ele air elemental type things, right? What a great finale. This book has been exciting. It's a like a light fairy tale for adults, but with, with an all-ages feel to it. But it's not an all-ages book, don't get me wrong. But it's definitely something that's going to remind you of your childhood. It's definitely something... It's kind of like a darker version of, oh, I don't know, like a, a Narnia book or something like that in some kind of way, or an Oz or something like that. And those books, they get pretty freaking dark on their own. But this book is awesome. It's got a great variant cover. Scotty Young and Company completely nail the ending. I just hats off. Kudos to you. What a great book. What a great ending. I can't wait to sit down and read all 18 issues. And if you haven't read Middle West... You just wait. Book three will be coming on its way. Hopefully a deluxe hardcover. And in its entirety, it's going to be a great, great journey. At number two, Kanto and the Clockwork Fairies. Number one, from IDW Publishing. Written by David M. Boer, with artwork by Drew Zucker. Vittorio Astoni on the coloring. Darren Bennett on the lettering. So Kanto was one of my favorite books last year, period. Y'all know that. And this book kind of hit. And it just hit hard. It's a very simple fantasy fairy tale type thing, but it really completely encapsulates everything about the hero's journey, everything about the archetypes, and it all is just like mainlined story directly into your soul. At least that's how I feel. The artwork is absolutely splendid. Kanto is the story of a knight who lives in a world where the knights, they were enslaved in the last series. This is a one-shot that's actually set between the previous series and what's coming up. It's got another mini-series debuting, I believe, in, in August, Kanto and the Hollow Men. But this is a great one-shot comic book. Even if you missed what came before, you could jump right in on this and read it and enjoy it. The artwork is great. Like I said, Zucker is able to make these characters incredibly expressive, right? Incredibly expressive, even though there's not like facial detail to use, but he does so much with the body language and with the eyes. The coloring by Vittorio Estoni is absolutely beautiful. Great texture, great gradients there. I absolutely loved it. The lettering is top notch as well. This was almost the pick of the week. Almost. Not quite, but do not sleep on Kanto. This is a great one shot. I believe it was underprinted, maybe allocated to stores. That's what I've heard. So, Good luck finding it, but if you can find it, get a hold of it and read it, and it will touch your heart, and it's going to be mainlined story directly into your soul. The way that Boer and company can just give a deceptively simple story that means so much and resonates so much with subtext and thematic relevance, 
it's just absolutely gorgeous. It's beautiful. And it still is one of the best books on shelves. And at number one, Decorum, number three, from Image Comics. Written by Jonathan Hickman, with artwork by Mike Huddleston, Russ Wooten on the lettering, Sasha E. Head for the design. Y'all, Decorum is blowing me away. Of course, I expect no less from Jonathan Hickman. This is a very intricate world that has been built up. Hickman knows what he's doing. He's telling an incredibly simple story. A story about an assassin who has found a possible apprentice. But this assassin is someone who has impeccable decorum, great manners, perfect etiquette, right? So that brings out some cool, interesting humor. In this issue, she takes her new apprentice to her sisterhood, and now they're training her. Now they're trying to figure out if she's going to be worthy. And so you get some cliche moments in here. But what makes this book stand out is that Hickman has built this entire world. Not a world, a universe. People always talk about great world building. Well, let's talk about Hickman's great universal building. Can we please talk about that? There is so much set dressing on this book that I think it's... Some people are finding it a bit confusing and off-putting, but it's really a simple story. It's about an assassin with impeccable etiquette trying to find an apprentice to train. That's one of the simplest stories you can get, but there's a lot of cool sci-fi, crazy comic book kookiness that's wrapped around that, and in typical Hickman fashion, charts, graphs, and maps, and all kinds of back matter. Really cool stuff, and I love it. The artwork, though, is the reason why it was the pick of the week. Mike Huddleston is stretching himself so far and exploring so much unexplored territory in comic book art, at least to me. I think this is groundbreaking. It's innovative. It is absolutely amazing. The way the pages are laid out, the way the artwork style and the coloring and the accent on the coloring will vary from scene to scene. I absolutely love it. It's almost like no page is quite like another. You have these amazingly, beautifully rendered giant landscapes, and then you have some very simple line work, it seems at times, with just a little bit of color here and there. But it really captures the nuance of the emotion and the agitation at times in the story. This is a great issue. It's got some light stuff in it. It's got some heavy stuff in it. But overall, I'm loving it and I am well beyond sold on the eight-issue series that is going to be Decorum, of which now we have issue number three, and it made the pick of the week, and number one on the top ten. So that's what I read. That's what I thought about it. What did you read? What did you love? What's your top five? What's your top ten? What's your top three? What's your top pick of the week? Let us know in the comments below, and let's keep this conversation going. Thank you so much for checking out the video. Please do like, share, subscribe, click the notification bell, and join us over at popculturephilosophers.com for podcast blogs, to, uh, top, you know, all, for a bunch of stuff. <laughs> join us over at popculturephilosophers.com for a lot of stuff. Anyway, thank you so much for checking out the video. I've been rocking Robbie Billups. Thanks for rocking with us. Keep on reading.